Good evening, everyone. I see two people, Ms. Garcia, Ms. Newman, and uh, oh, one more person came in, and Ms. Melania came in as well. So let me write the names down. Where did I start? Yes, we started. This is MED 210, Anatomy and Physiology. Um, two, MED 210, of course, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, probably all of you are cooking, like uh, my family as well, and doing shopping and whatnot. Ooh, what was that? Okay. Uh, what is due this week? Uh, week six items, task six, discussion six, lesson six. And what are we doing today? This is week seven and November 24th. And we have, uh, I believe, it is it December 1 next week? Um, but I'll make, uh, next week we are on campus for our first laboratory, we're gonna do, I think, uh, let's do kidney and uh, maybe a, a kidney and eyeball. And uh, um, that's for next week. But what's for this week, our lecture is uh, sensory perception. Okay, so chapter 14.1. So we're gonna talk about hearing. We're gonna talk about olfactory, which is uh, smell. Gustatory, which is taste. Oh, here's hearing and balance as well. And um, right in your task seven, there's special senses laboratory. Please don't do the laboratory, but we have some lovely notes right here, okay? Which kind of mirrors the stuff we're doing. So eye, ear, tongue and taste, nose and smell. Okay, and uh, the, 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 so let's go right into it. What was it, chapter 14? Yes. So let's go right into chapter 14 in our open stacks. Fix my, we got dual screens coming up. Let's go down, chapter 14. So if we're looking at on the, the uh, uh, the scale of things of homeostasis. Let's look at let's look at uh, uh, homeostasis for a second. Let's put this down here, I guess. So if you're looking at this homeostasis diagram, and this is this is uh, uh, the classic diagram here. Let's, have, let's take this copy image and let's look at it. Do it like this. Move it. Now, where do we need to be? We always need to be in the middle because too much of a good thing, you're sick, or that's pathology, disease. Too little of a good thing, that's also pathology, it's disease. We need to be somewhere in the middle. And of course, how do we do that? You have ascending fibers and descending fibers. The control center is always your brain. So what we're looking at today is this part of the pathway of homeostasis. This is your sensory pathway, also known as your afferent pathway. It requires some energy modality like for example, uh, you're looking at the screen, the energy you are detecting is light, light, uh, light waves, okay? And your brain then interprets what you're seeing. And of course, the second part of the path, right, is your efferent pathway or descending tract, descending fibers, descending nerves that go to an effector to change a response. So for example, you're detecting changes of light. You see a fist coming at your head. You will interpret it and then go, hey, maybe it's a good idea to have my motor pathway or my descending effector pathway to move my head out of the way or put my hands up to maintain homeostasis, okay? Keep you out of danger, to keep you in the healthy zone, okay? Now, then, what I find the neat and interesting thing about this chapter is that 
what you are listening to, you are, uh, your ears have receptors in it that are detecting sound waves. You are not really listening to my voice. My voice that you're hearing right now is an interpretation of what you think my voice sounds like in your head. The diagram, this color blue, this color, I don't know, maroon or red is an interpretation of what your brain, the control center is interpreting. That's how you can get hallucinations, either auditory or visual. Um, all of us had that experience, you know, when you're tired or maybe you got a ghost or a poltergeist uh, following you around, who knows, right? It's late at night or even or real early in the morning and you could have sworn somebody moved, you know, at the corner of your eye. Your light, your receptor picked up movement when there's no real movement, there's no real ghost. It is a figment of your imagination provided to you by the control center, which is your brain. How many of you have children? And when they're finally away out of the house, you still hear them. That is also a hallucination, an auditory hallucination. So you could see how the brain is very important to us. And if the brain is outside the parameters of health, outside the parameters of homeostasis, it is going to start misinterpreting what the receptor does. And then you're going to start reacting to it. That's why psychiatry and neurology, they're very, very interested in this part. Neurology, we're very, well, they are, not me. I'm not a neurologist. They're very interested in this part, the sensory, okay? How are you picking up uh, changes or some sort of imbalance or stimulus? A stimulus is something that starts this process. So that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at this part. We're looking at what the receptor is, what nerve, and what part of the brain does it connect into? If you can answer all those things regarding sight, sound, smell, touch, you're good to go for this chapter. So let us, where's, 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 that's what I don't like about Max. They don't, they auto close everything out. Okay. So that's what a sensory receptor is. One example, example of a sensory receptor is a photoreceptor. It responds or picks up light waves, light rays. That is the stimuli for change. You see something, right? You're gonna react to it. This is your typical, uh, uh, typical nerve. There are nerve endings, dendrites, that pick up a signal and then they run it along the nerve, uh, uh, nerve, nerve axon, and then they pass it along. The thing about neurologic and nerves is that it's very fast. The action potential or the electricity doesn't have to go through this axon or this wire like all at once, it can hop. And that's what this blue stuff here, that's myelin. And that's kind of like a, it's, it's made out of mostly out of fat and it's, um, uh, what do you call that? It helps the electricity jump and that's called saltatory conduction and it's faster than just going. So what's easier? This nice and slow or what? Jump, 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 right? If you're jumping, saltatory conduction is much faster. That's why when you see somebody flash a light in your eyes, you automatically pick it up. It's in milliseconds, it's very quick. If someone pokes you with a pin, you will feel it very quickly because it's running through nerves. And the nerve endings also have uh, uh, run through uh, chemicals as well. So the main takeaway from this picture is, is that it's fast, the signal, the signal or the electricity is called an action potential and it's both electrical and at the ends, it's chemical. So both electricity and chemicals can mess with that sensory pathway that we talked about. So if I give you drugs, that's a chemical, that's gonna be a problem. If uh, I just did a lecture on what do you do when you, elect 
when you get electrocuted. Please do not touch that person after they've been electrocuted. Because remember, we're one big battery. We can hold a charge. Okay? And uh, if I zap you full of electricity, it's going to mess with this as well. So that's a both A and B question. How do your nerves move a signal? They move it elect electrically and chemically. That's two things. Um, da, da, da. Let's see. So we got different types of receptors, different types of things that can pick up things or sense things, because that's what we're talking about today, special senses. Chemoreceptor can pick up chemicals. One of the greatest chemoreceptors that we have is for carbon dioxide. It regulates our breathing. We learned that from anatomy and physiology one. You also have osmoreceptors, especially when it deals with uh, solute concentration in body fluids. And we also learned that in uh, um, anatomy and physiology one regarding your kidneys. Nociceptors, that is for pain stimuli and or itching. Um, you kind of know that because uh, anyone who's ever had, um, you know, narcotics for uh, any pain management, what happens when the narcotic starts fading away? You get itchy. And it's actually a, 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 a big side effect of, of um, um, what do you call that? Um, narcotic analgesic medication. No C-ceptors. Think um, physical pain stimuli pain stimulant. Mechanoreceptors tells you about balance. We're going to talk a little bit of uh, uh, one of our main mechanoreceptors in our ears. There's also mechanoreceptors in all of our joints and our tendons that tell us, you know, uh, where your muscles and where your joints are at. And of course, the thermoreceptor, it tells, it tells me, you know, am I hot? Am I cold? And that goes awry too when you get older. Uh, my father uh, when he was alive, he used to leave the house like it was 40 degrees. I don't know why. It'd be even it'd be even in winter and he'd have the air conditioning on. Because as you get older, what happens to your skin, what happens to your thermoreceptors, they they change and they and all of this gets changed when you get older. So a sensor, sensory modality. Now, what does that mean? A sensory modality is um, uh, what does the sensor actually pick up and the sensory modality no matter what they what your um for example thermoreceptor picks up heat or lack of heat and all a sensor does is it changes that data or it changes that sensory data to electricity and we already talked about the electricity the action potential that's the only thing the brain can understand so it goes from sensor to nerve to brain. And once it goes to the nerve, that's already an action potential, that's already electricity. And then the brain then has to um, interpret um, um, that uh, sensory modality. Okay. Uh, so that's the data or the information that gets coded. And uh, um, so all of these things that these sensories are, are picking up, eventually get encoded onto an action potential, onto electricity, because that's the only thing your brain really understands. So that thing I just said a minute ago when we were looking at um, the homeostasis diagram, everything that you're seeing, hearing, and experience in life, in a way, it's not really real. It's, it is a machination or a construction of your brain. That's why if ever, you know, have you ever went on like Facebook or YouTube where they have that thing where um, like someone is saying something, but you could perceive it in like eight different ways. Uh, like someone's chanting something, right? And it's, uh, and, and you're, and like eight different people are hearing it eight different ways. It's because that's, um, it's, it's due to interpretation of your brain. It's just like also, I used to um, run a school that had a criminal justice program. And one of my favorite laboratories that my, my professors used to ask me to uh, come in on was, um, I forgot the criminal justice class, but it was one of those classes where you learn how to uh, interview uh, witnesses. 
And it was really cool because I got to rob the class uh, twice a week. I went in, put in a ski mask. I, you know, I demanded money uh, from somebody and then everybody would have to write down. And it was really interesting. Like how many times they were like, uh, they totally got my description wrong because what you're seeing gets interpreted by your brain and there is bias. Uh, like you look on the news, like every time you see a video um, of interaction with police, half of the people say, oh my God, they're animals. And the other half like, oh, that person deserved it. How can you have two very polarized um, interpretations of the same exact video? Because remember, it all gets encoded, it all gets encoded onto electricity and your brain then starts sorting it out, okay? And that's what's going on here. So let's talk about the first one, taste, right? And taste is highly subjective. How many times you've eaten a really awesome taco and then, you know, your partner next to you will be like, oh my God, this is garbage. I'm never coming back here again. And then you're like, uh, what? what are you crazy? This is the best taco I've ever had. And I'm looking at my wife. She's like, no, it is crap. And um, how? Well, remember, gustatory sense or your taste sense um, is again, once it gets encoded, it is highly subjective and it depends on the brain. Now, they have this term that uh, when every time they talk about uh, gustation is this word umami. It's like when you know something's delicious. Sometimes they, uh, uh, you know, and that has to actually deal with fats or lipids. There has been research in probably the last 10, 20 years um, there's something called a lipostat, right? And um, lipostats and umami, uh, you know how, like for me, I love Doritos, but if you give me the, you know, the baked healthy version, I'd be like, no, it's not doing it for me because what am I really tasting? I am really tasting the fat and, uh, uh, or the lipids. And that's what a lipostat is. And that's what uh, uh, current research is stating what umami is. That's why when you go to a restaurant, like, hey, I made that omelet at home. It doesn't taste as good. Or I made that burger. It doesn't taste as good as McDonald's or as that restaurant. And I could tell you right now why. Um, I've been getting really into uh, a lot of cooking lately because, of course, everyone has because of the pandemic. Uh, when, I, when I load the thing full of oil and butter and salt, it makes a makes a world of difference and that's the reason why you go out because it's really salty it's really buttery and it tastes way too good for it uh and that's umami that's that delicious taste sensation it's usually uh right here like in the center of your tongue now you will notice that your tongue right here if you look at this that the, there's different shapes of taste buds you don't need to know Fundiform papilla, you don't need to know that, but you can start looking and look at your tongue in the mirror. Stick out your tongue in the mirror and you're gonna see that there's different textures on your tongue. Now, your tongue can taste different things in different areas. We used, pre-COVID, we used to do this labor, uh, laboratory in our lab when we were on the ground class, uh, where we uh, took a survey and we only gave uh, sugary things and we asked, well, where's where in your tongue you tasted the sugar the most? Where in the tongue you tasted the salt the most? Well, the way you taste is this. You have to have an aqueous environment, which you have um, uh, in your mouth. It's moist in there because of your salivary glands. And then you have these taste pores, these little holes that go into your taste buds, okay? And you have these hair cells. The hair cells pick up they're, they're, they are essentially chemoreceptors and they pick up certain things. So on, um, I, I forgot where's where, let's go. Here, it's funny. You look at the breakdown of your tongue. Let's look at this. Sweet and salty go together. They're near the tip of your tongue. Umami, I already mentioned it was here in the center. Sour is on the sides and bitter is in the back. 
And sour makes sense because that's where, um, you know, you have your, um, your salivary glands. They're located laterally, right? Here on the sides. That's sour. Sweet and salty is on the tip of your tongue and bitter, especially, you know, when you back, when you back down some beer. Oh, that's the best taste when it goes right back here because um, uh, beer has a little bit of a bitter taste. And the fifth floor, which is our culinary brothers and sisters, headed by Chef Nori Hathaway upstairs, they play on this science right here. And that's why things taste, uh, taste good because they know the chemistry of this and how this all works together. For, uh, and a classic example is chocolate. Really good chocolate isn't just sweet. Really good chocolate also has a decent amount of salt in it. And how do you know? Uh, try eating, um, uh, uh, um, you know, baker's chocolate before they process it, before they, you know, before they put it in the mix. It tastes awful. It doesn't taste good at all. But then, of course, you put your different spices and you put your, um, uh, your salt in it. It starts changing and then it starts being delicious. So what are the sensory? It's the taste hairs. It must be in an aqueous environment. By the way, your gustatory sense goes along with your olfactory or your smell because it's hard to taste something if you can't smell it. And we already know that from when you're, um, uh, you know, when you're sick, even, your, even a nice steak when you have a really bad cold tastes like what? Tastes like cardboard, okay? So that's all that these taste hairs are. They're chemoreceptors. And then they transduce that signal. For example, if it's salty, sodium. And then they send it out uh, uh, onto these nerves, right? And then onto your brain. Okay. Olfaction, that's smell. Olfactory sense also goes with um, uh, your taste, as we just mentioned. That too has to be in an aqueous environment. Um, uh, was this class is the class I mentioned? Like I, I was in the sedan years ago, and I was standing on top of a big pile of uh, of uh, feces. I don't know if it was camel, horse. Who knows? All I knew is I was standing on what I thought was mud, but I didn't smell it until we went inside. I, I forgot. I think it was either the APC or, or uh, maybe like inside the barracks or something. And somebody was like, oh, what's that nasty smell? And then I smelled it. Now, why? Because um, if you've ever been in that part of the world, uh, parts of Northern Africa, it's very arid. It's very dry. So you don't really smell stuff. Um, same thing if you've ever been on top of a mountain, uh, you can't, it's really hard to smell things because it has to be in, in, in a, uh, a moist aqueous environment. But those of us who've been in jungles before, oh boy, um, my home country, the Philippines and the lovely, lovely jungle warfare school in Okinawa, Japan. Oh, you smell everything. Ugh, it's gross. Because why? It's in a aqueous environment that goes into hair cells. Let's show them here, right? So you see that aqueous environment, it's vapor right off your coffee. Let's talk about something nice. Why am I always thinking of bad smells? Nice smells, like coffee, right? And it goes up in here. Right here is your cribriform plate. Within your cribriform plate of your ethmoid, there are nerves that go in here. And these nerves here, right, of the olfactory cilia, and cilia are these little finger-like, hair-like projection, uh, uh, projections right here. They pick up those chemicals and then change it into electricity. And then it sends it through the olfactory neurons right into your brain. And here's your olfactory tract and olfactory bulb, which is at the uh, uh, frontal part of your brain that's right here. And you can see why people do... Uh, unscrupulous people, hopefully not healthcare people that you know, um, do cocaine or heroin or, or, or Zanny bars, push up Zan Xanax, which is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. 
but people do it. It goes up here, right? You have a moist, mucus-like environment. Remember, we talked about that in Anatomy Physiology 1. Mucus there is to trap things. Well, all that powder gets trapped up here. Then it stimulates all this. Then, it's, uh, then it sends that chemical and that signal all the way up directly into your brain when you snort that nastiness. And that's why you see all of this gets destroyed because you got to think about it. That powder is an abrasive material and you're uh, snorting it up as fast as you can to bash it like little rocks, to bash up against all of this. That's why they get nosebleeds and, and all these other uh, associated problems with the nasal cavity. That's why this gets the wear down, this wears down, this wears down. And of course your brain wears down, never a good thing. So we're thinking that if my patient that has an anosmia, they can't smell, I have to start thinking about, is it a neurologic thing? Is there something blocking the hair cells? Is there too much mucus? So these are the things that you got, now that you understand how this all works, you gotta start investigating that pathway. Okay. Auditory, audition, hearing. Now, with the ear, they have two functions. One, of course, is audition, hearing, and the other one is. Um, I think I'm show it here. Is balance. Okay. Let's look at this in greater detail. All righty, the outside external ear is called the auricle. And uh, they also call this here the pinna, P-I-N-N-A. And there's all specific names for all these little nooks and crannies, but we don't care. All we care about is there's an external ear canal or external auditory canal, it's right here. And then you have the auricle slash pinna, which is out here which serves no real purpose other than to provide a hole. It doesn't direct sound into here. Uh, we know from data from people who've got their ears cut off or are damaged. It, uh, your ear is essentially to hold up your glasses and, and, and really nice place to put your earrings on, okay? Now, the middle ear, that's where the transduction starts occurring. You have sound waves that travel through your external auditory canal, and then it goes into your internal part, which is part of your middle ear. It hits this tympanic membrane, which is your eardrum. The eardrum starts shaking. Now, put your hand in front of your mouth one day. Not now, maybe later. And if I'm talking really, so really soft, there's a certain level of vibration. But if I'm talking really loud, there's a certain amount of vibration that occurs your tympanic membrane. And based on that, that vibration from the sound waves hitting this tympanic membrane, then start moving the three smallest bones in your body, your malleus, incus, and stapes. Malleus is uh, Latin for hammer, incus is anvil, and stapes is um, stirrups, you know, like uh, the stirrups on a horse. Uh, I don't know. I don't ride horses. I'm a city boy. So I don't know anything about that. But just know that the three smallest bones in your body located in the middle ear are your malleus, incus, and stapes, and they help with transduction of sound waves to stuff that the vestibular cochlear nerve can understand as electricity. After it goes, the vibrations go through here, it goes through the oval window. And then now we are in the realm of the inner ear. And just like what I always talked about before, all the stuff that could get damaged and that's you know important and protective is all out here. But the further in you inward you go, the more delicate, more serious structures are located on the more inside of the human body, as as pictured in here, where you have uh, you have your cochlea here, you have your vestibule and your vestibular cochlear nerve, right here. Uh, your cochlear nerve deals with hearing. Your vestibular nerve deals with balance, and we're going to talk more about that uh, in the pictures to come. In the inner to middle ear, you have your eustachian, also known as your station tube, potato, potato. I'm not quite sure how we pronounce it. I've heard it pronounced both ways. 
but there's pressure build up here. And we all know this, uh, especially if you've ever gone diving or you've got on, on a plane or gotten on a, um, you know, in a skyscraper, gotten on an elevator to like, you know, the hundredth floor or whatever. You hear your ears pop because your eustachian tube is this extra pressure release valve, if you will, for your middle to inner ear. And it connects directly into your oropharynx. So it can, um, it, it releases that pressure. And that's why when you're on a plane or whatever, you'll hear your, you'll feel, you'll feel your, um, your ears pop. So let's look at how exactly. Okay. So you have sound waves. They run at a, a specific frequency. Okay. Slower the frequency, the lower the sound. And it's measured in hertz or cycles per second. And an iris frequency, if I talk like this, like Michael Jackson, right? That'll be what? Of course, uh, higher frequencies. And there's a certain level that affects this transduction here from your tympanic membrane to your ossicles, right through your stapes to the oval window, and then into the uh, organ of Corti right here. So you can see there, once it goes into the organ of Corti, right into the, um, it's like it's like a shell, but inside the shell, there's, there's these tunnels. And these tunnels are going to, um, they're gonna mess with fluid that's already in these tunnels. And then when the fluid moves, it, there's, there's these hair cells here that picks up that movement. And depending on, you know, what frequency of waves, that's the signal that it's gonna send in your vestibular cochlear nerve. So you have movement, right? You have sound, and then movement, and then electrical activity due to the movement of fluid that's inside your cochlea, okay? So it sets up these little waves and it all depends on this. And that's why right now the voice you are hearing, okay, it is your brain's interpretation of what my voice is. Who knows? And that's why when you listen to a recording of your own voice, it sounds bizarre because when you're hearing it in real time, it's very, very different. And even that too is a, is a machination of your control center, AKA your brain, okay? So here's another cross section of the organ of Corti, you know, that little cell, right? And you can see here the cochlear branch of cranial nerve eight, that's a VIII, Roman numeral eight. And the cranial nerve eight has two functions, cochlear and the vestibular. The cochlear part is the hearing part. And you can see here, like uh, use your imagination a little bit, uh, there'll be fluid in here and then the fluid shakes and then, uh, um, uh, what do you call that? The little hair cells that are here will vibrate on a certain um, frequency and that vibration will then be converted to electricity that the cochlear branch of your cranial nerve eight can then understand. So the organ of Corti in here, it's essentially hair cells. Okay. And then the fluid moves around, that moves around in a certain, in, at a certain rate. So in a way, if we perfect um, artificial intelligence, knowing, knowing how we know, we could pretty much simulate anyone's voice if we please. And that's actually um, happening right now in the music industry. Auto-tunes is just the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. And this is stuff that we're talking about, high frequency and low frequencies. And that's just how many times this thing moves to move the fluid in here and then activate those hair cells. Okay. Now, the balance part of the show does it a little bit different, but it's the same thing. If you look at... Let's look at, um,
these are utricles and saccule. And if you notice, let's look at uh, let's look at our original photo for perspective. Okay. This is the vestibular nerve. The utricle and saccule, these things right here, these rings, they deal with balance. The vestibular nerve part of the cochlear, the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve eight, you put these two nerves together, you have cranial nerve eight, that deals with balance. And if you look at the utricle and saccule, these rings, they also have endolymph, which is some fluid inside these rings. And you'll notice one ring goes up and down. One ring goes left to right. Another ring goes kind of diagonally. And then you have one set in your left ear, another set in your right ear. And this is what happens. When I move my head, either which way, the, the fluid, in the, um, the endolymph fluid inside these rings of circles start moving the hair cells. When the, when, when this starts moving the hair cells, they bend a certain way, it's going to send a message to your brain. So if I'm tilting my head to the left, all of the fluid's gonna move to the left side. So it's gonna tell me what? Hey, your head's to the left. Same thing if I move it right, up, down, or hang myself upside down. And that's how you could tell what is called proprioception, which side's up, what's up, down, what's left, right. And that is what your um, semicircular canals do. And you could see one is oriented this way, up and down. The other one's oriented this way, kind of like left to right. And there's another one that's like diagonal. That's why when, uh, you know, my three-year-old loves spinning, spinning himself like a top, what is he doing? He's spinning all the fluid inside these semicircular canals so they can float around and make him dizzy because that's the message uh, that he wants to send to his brain. Little kids for you, right? Now, also, this is also the reason why when you take drugs or when you take alcohol, why everything gets so dizzy. Because yes, the fluid is moving at the rate of gravity, but the signal to your brain is moving differently because you have different chemicals and different drugs in your system. That's why if any of you ever been really hungover, you put your head on the pillow and then the whole, it's like, it's almost a second later. It's so delayed, the whole room then moves and moves slow and makes you ill, makes you sick, right? Also kind of adds to the euphoric, happy nature of it, but still at the end of the day, it's really not healthy, not good for you. We already touched on somatic sensation or uh, touch um, uh, in your epidermis. We talked about these two things, their Pacinian corpuscles and your Meisner. Think Pacinian, think deep in your dermis, almost to your subcutaneous tissue. That's deep touch. And your Meisner uh, corpuscles that are up top, that they're, that's for light touch. That's for uh, uh, what they call tactile sense. You know, your your uh, 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 light touch, okay? Those are always asked. Mm. Piscinian and Meisner's, they always ask about that and location. Now, remember I me mentioned like your muscles kind of know where they are, like how your, uh, where your arms are, where your legs are, well, that's your tendon stretch, your Golgi tendon organ. Uh, it, it, it kind of informs your muscles, uh, like, you know, how much, how much stretch or how, uh, how much uh, tension there are, is within your muscle versus uh, muscle connected to bone. And that's your Golgi. Okay. The eye, it's the eye nose. Now, again, this might be a freaky thing to say. Everything that you're looking at is your brain's interpretation of what you're looking at. And it's also, that's why I'm also such a fan of uh, study that it's repetitive. Like if you keep on doing the same thing over and over and over again, what happens? It gets ingrained into your mind and it becomes 
almost second nature. And therefore the response to that, and that's training will be quicker, okay? Um, uh, it, um, so if you're looking at this eyeball, let's look at the parts. You have here these extraocular muscles. You will notice that your eyeballs move all in the same direction. And we're gonna talk about why uh, in a moment. But just know what moves your eyeballs around are these muscles. You have your superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and lateral rectus. Rectus means straight. So your superior rectus, that means it has to move your eyes straight up. Medial rectus has to move your eyes towards your midline or towards your nose. Inferior rectus has to move your eyes downward. Lateral rectus moves your eyes to the right or left, depending, um, I mean, laterally to, to the sides, to the right or left. Now, of course, they all have to move together. So, and we're gonna talk about why in a moment, but the muscles that can control that are your rectus muscles or your straight muscles here in your eye and that, that you have here. There's also protection functions because your eye is really important. You need to see to move around. You could see how deep in the pocket here in your orbit it is. You could also feel around in your eye when you're when you're when you're when you're touching that area. You could see there's um, uh, right here on your uh, eyebrow, which is also protective as well. It, it any dust or dandruff or heaven knows what gets caught up in there. It also gets caught up in your eyebrows. The cornea is also a nice protective layer. And then you could also look at your zygomatic bone, your cheekbones. When you press your eyes down, it also protects that eye from being poked, okay? So there's a lot of neat things. Oh, here's a better picture. So you got your superior rectus of that, that'll pull your eye what? Up. Inferior rectus, pull your eye down. Lateral rectus, pull your eye to, uh, and if this is my right eye, your lateral rectus will pull your eye to the right. And your medial rectus on the right eye will pull your eye towards, of course, your bridge of your nose. And you also have obliques because you can then you look up into the right, up into the left, down and you have superior obliques and inferior obliques. And then that's why when the doctor is shining the pen light in your eye and they say stuff like, hey, can you look at the, um, not move your head and, and follow the pen light with your, uh, with your eye. I am checking the nervous connection between cranial nerves three, four, and six for all six of these muscles. And that's what the doctor's doing or the neurologist is doing. They're checking on them. Uh, da, 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 da. You also have the white portion of the eye, which is a sclera. Your cornea is clear, okay? Again, they are coverings. They are protective coverings. There's a middle layer, which is your vascular layer or your vascular tunic. The word tunic means like a coat or a little jacket. And that's the layer that has all the, um, um, you know, all the vasculature, all the, you know, when you're bloodshot, that's all the stuff. Now, choroid layer is highly vascularized and that is also provides a lot of uh, blood supply to your eyeball because remember your eyeball is a living, breathing thing. And also you have a whole bunch of muscles there that also have to support it. Now, uh, iris is the color part of your eye. And it, of course, can help open and close this part, which is your pupil. And this is where the light goes in and out, okay? And your pupils get dilated. They can get really, really big. Or they can constrict, get really, really small, depending on what does my eye need, on how much light does it need for it to go see something or to pick up uh, light rays, okay? Now, when we're looking at the eye on the side view here, the main function of the eye, of course, is to pick up light rays. So there's something called refraction. The concept of refraction is um, um, light moves at a certain speed through different media. For example, if you're looking at your hand through air, it looks like your hand, but um, go in a fishbowl, stick your hand inside the fishbowl, then it get, looks weird. For any of us who have ever had fish uh, in a fishbowl or uh, in an aquarium, you know it's kind of a little bit of adjustment because the water looks a little bit weird. And even weirder, how about looking through something through 
um, like, a, 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 like, like a glass of oil. And that's called refraction or the bending of light. And that's what your eye does. Its function is to bend light onto this retinal layer that's right here, this yellow layer that's in the back of your eye. And in your retina, that's where all the cameras are, the rods and cones. And we're gonna talk about them in a minute. And of course, get supplied by the choroid layer right here. Your scleral layer is that tough layer, okay? This tough white layer that, uh, you know, that helps uh, protect the outer portion of the eye as well. And remember, all the tough stuff's on the outside, all the uh, soft and mushy stuff is on the inside. And speaking of soft and mushy stuff, you have two rooms. You have a front room here and a back room all the way back here. The front part or the anterior chamber is cover, it has water-like material in it. And that water-like material is your aqueous humor. Humor in Latin means um, uh, fluid. So here in the front, that's your aqueous humor. In the back, you have your vitreous humor. And something that's vitreous is like uh, thick and oil-like. So changing from water to like oil, from air to water to oil, light rays go through this pupil. The whole of the pupil gets controlled by this, uh, by the iris, and of course by the lens. And you have your ciliary, uh, uh, ciliary body uh, and muscle here, which also moves around this lens. And then they bend light to make sure it hits the back of the retina. When will you have vision problems? When, if the water here is dirty, if the jelly back here is dirty, if the cornea gets scratched up, if the uh, pupil doesn't respond very well, and if these muscles, when you get older, that's why you have presbyop presby uh, presbyopsis, which is, you know, vision of older age. It just happens. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I thought I had super, super perfect vision. Um, but uh, right after medical school, everything just got started getting blurry because things just get older and have some wear and tear. Okay. Another thing that affects the bending of light is the shape of the eyeball. You could see this eyeball is, you know, relatively round, but I have astigmatism left. When it starts looking like an egg and getting like oblong, well, then it's going to start messing with the, um, the bending of the light and it might not fall on this retina too well. And if it falls, if the image falls a little in front of the retina or behind the retina, that's when you have blurry vision and that's when you have, um, you know, um, nearsightedness and farsightedness. And we're, I think we're going to briefly talk about that in a moment. Of course, your retina, which your rods and cones, converts all that light energy into uh, electricity, also known as your action potential, in your cranial nerve to, also known as your optic nerve that goes straight into your brain. And of course, there's a central uh, retina, uh, retinal artery and vein that goes here that has to also feed all of this. Because not only the chorade feels, feeds all of this, so does um, your central retinal artery and vein. Now there's a blind spot. This is your optic disc right here. Because think of the retina as a camera and a camera has to have wires in it to go into the optic nerve. So think of all of these are the lenses of the cameras, but then all the wires have to go down some central pathway. So does the, um, uh, the artery and vein have to go down the central pathway of the optic nerve. So there's a point where there's no cameras and that is your optic disc, also known as your blind spot. And I, re I remember that I mentioned to you guys about 10 minutes ago that there's a reason why both your eyes have to move in the same direction. Because in actuality, when you're looking straight ahead, right? Even if you're looking only with one eye, you, there is a blind spot. So the right eye has a blind spot, but the left eye sees that blind spot and tells your brain about all the stuff that's missing. Your right eye, because your left eye also has a blind spot, but your right eye sees that blind spot and then tells your brain all the stuff that that part of the eye is missing. So that in your brain, when you look around the room, there's no dark, dark spots. When you have both your eyes working, you look around the room and you see everything intact. Now, a nice little thing that you could do on, uh, 
YouTube is a blind Watch this Lucid video. Chart makes intelligent diagramming easy and helps your best ideas become real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're beyond that. Okay, try it one more time. You can come where we cannot see the light. And what does it mean? It is a spot on the retina of the eye where we cannot see the light when it's incident on it. I will explain its details a little bit later, but first I will prove its existence to you through an experiment. Okay. Let's go back to the start again. Close your left eye and stay still with your right eye focused on the dot. Yes, I want you to stay still and concentrate with your right eye on the dot present on the left of your screen. Now with you. Okay, so cover your left eye and look straight at that dot. Not the plus sign, but the dot. Now, what happened when you did that? Left eye closed. I want you to slowly bring your face towards the screen. At some point in time, you will find that the plus sign on the right disappears. Yes, but in order for that to happen, you must focus only on the dot and nothing else. Okay, try it one more time. You can cover your left eye with your left hand, focus only on the dot and slowly come closer to the screen. Now, you could do the same thing on the plus sign with your right eye. Cover your right eye, focus on the plus sign, move your head towards or uh, uh, slowly towards the, your, uh, your, um, your monitor of your laptop or wherever you're looking at, and you will see the other shape disappear. And that's how you know you have a blind spot. And that's also how you know that your brain fills in the blanks, that what you're looking at is not uh, like a camera. What you're looking at is your brain's interpretation of what everything is. And that, that when I was studying, I found freaky because, so I started questioning like, oh, so is everything I'm experiencing a lie? No, it's not a lie, but it is a machination of my brain. So it's tainted with history. It's tainted with bias. Um, like like uh, how many times me and my wife were, well, you know, you go shopping for clothes for the kids or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I don't like that green jacket. It doesn't look right on my son. And my wife goes, that's not green, it's blue. And I'm like, are you insane? That's green. Okay, crazy lady. And then, of course, then it gets into some uh, other uh, stuff that uh, we shouldn't, that is beyond the scope of this class. But it's not that she's crazy. It's not that I'm crazy. It's just that it goes, I see things a different way. And uh, she sees things uh, 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 a totally different way. And again, it's because of the interpretation of the brain and knowing and understanding that that's how you can understand other people better and your patients better, knowing that they have their own individual biases and their own individual takes on something. So, and, and you know, it makes, makes you understand people a little bit better and, and gives some leeway on, you know, on, on, on what is reality for different people. Now the retina has these things called rods and cones. You see these receptors, they look like a cone. And these rod and these receptors, these green ones, look like a rod. Now rods are for night vision and uh, vision acuity. You know at night, do you ever notice there's like no real color? Everything's like shades of gray. Um, and things are kind of like un unclear at night. Um, that's why me as a shooter, I love training at night or low light. Um, I'm at a gun range where once a month they shut off the lights uh, or they dim the lights um, for training. Because when you think about it, if something bad's gonna happen, it's not gonna happen in broad daylight. It's gonna happen in the dark. So you have to kind of train for that because you know I'm probably a very, very highly paranoid person, who knows? So that's what the rods are for, night vision and vision acuity. Now. What's the cones for? They're for day vision and color. They help you see colors. And we're um, maybe you know this or not, but if you like, if you look at the old school TVs, when you look really, really, really close at it, you only see three primary colors: red, green, and blue, or RGB. 
And then it is the different nuances and different combinations of red, green, and blue, which give us all these different nuances of color. So think cones, color, day. Rods, think evening, you know, visual acuity. And those are all in your receptors. And the light wave is a single unit light wave. You might see it one day, it's called a photon. Mm. Oh, remember Roy G. Biv when we were kids? It's a visual spectrum of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So anything that's ultraviolet or beyond the violet range, you can't see. Everything under or infrared, you can't see. Love infrared night vision. IR is so cool. In, and um, a really good... Uh, really good Gen 3 or Gen 4 night vision goggles. Ooh, am I bleeding? Jeez. Sorry, I'm having a little bit. Well, IR, you can't see it in the visual spectrum, but if you put on the goggles, you sure can see everything. So you could see that the combination of all that we see are red, green, and blue. Okay? And if you see the rods, they're more towards what? like uh, um, uh, this range and downwards. That's why rods don't see too much color. When it's night, go outside, see how many colors you can really identify. Not much. Whoop, whoops. Okay, I think we're done. Let's look at what we need to know. Did we go over? At R. Did we go over sensory perception and how it fits in the whole uh, homeostasis? Yes, we did. These videos are really great, by the way. Um, did we go to the structure and function of the eye? Yes. Structure and function of the ear? Yes. How tongue and taste and nose and smell, how they're related? Yes. So with that, with that being said, we have all the things you need. Special senses lab, uh, really nice notes in there. Quick summary notes is nice to have. And uh, watch those videos, they're pretty cool as well. Now let's look at the discussion. Sensory changes, individual lifestyles. Again, aging, you could have some sort of birth defect or injury. Remember, and if any, if, if you've ever had any trauma or any pathology, your body recovers, but it doesn't recover at 100%. So uh, like, for example, I used to have awesome knees, but damaged them, did a lot of running. So will I be able to run? Actually, now I'm slowly, slowly not being able to run uh, distances more than like two miles. So now I'm into like fast walking. Well, the same thing can be said with your sensory. Things change, right? And then that becomes a problem because you will have a problem picking up your sensory, especially regarding in communication with the outside world. So investigate some technologies. So we're talking about technology, therefore 2021. So find articles, journals, find these things that are from 2021. How, like, what, what's the latest thing in, in vision? What's the latest thing in hearing? Because how can I help somebody who can't taste? Imagine you can't taste, it's awful. So pick one or two examples and discuss how does this, up, how could these technologies improve quality of life? And if you have uh, pictures, make sure to reference them. You can look it up on YouTube on how to reference a, a, a photograph. So uh, please, 2021, because we're talking about technology and uh, answer only one person and if you answer them, again, I got to go back to what I've always been saying. Make sure you add to the discussion instead of goes, hey, Brian, you did really great. I learned a lot from you. You know, that's BS. How's this? Hey, Brian, that new technology about the ear sounds really, really interesting. I looked it up and there's, there's another company that's more cost effective than the one that you just quoted. It's almost $800 less. 
blah, 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 blah. See how you're adding to the, when you do that, you're adding to the discussion instead of just having the mutual adoration society. Oh, I hate that. You ever have that in meetings when everyone goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when it goes wrong, no one really looks at it critically. Everyone's too busy patting each other on the back. It's amazing. You won't get that in medicine. No one pats anybody on the back. We're all hypercritical and we're all, we all are looking at things uh, critically. Like I said, you got a 90 on exam. Okay, fine, great. You got an A, A minus. Who the heck cares? Are you looking at the 10% that you missed? Because one of, those, one of those items could be the thing that messed you up on a case and killed somebody or made somebody uh, worse, right? Uh, uh, my, my 14 year old is finally getting the joke. Um, I had a parent teacher conference because her, her math teacher was worried like, why was she, she already has like a, a B plus A minus in the class. And she was wondering why does she keep on going to the math workshop after schools on Wednesdays? Right. And I said, because she's focusing on the things that she got wrong. And she was like, oh, no, I think you may be stressing her out. I'm not stressing her out. Or if I am, I'm stressing her out. You need a little bit of stress. And he goes, or oh, how's this? Don't look at it like stress. Look at it like I got to fix what I got to fix. Right. If, if you had your car and 10 percent of it was covered in rust, would you just sit there and just leave it like that? Of course not. You go, you go and fix it. And if you, look at, if you look at your education in that way versus grades, because I'm telling you, uh, for those of you who did the application process, there's a whole bunch of you who uh, like, oh, I did really good on my, my T's. I got 80. Okay. Goes, How about the people who got 90? They're going to pick them first before you. Don't be that person. A whole bunch of people scored 72, 71. And they're like, think I'm going to get in? I'm, I don't know. You know, if you got 48 people after 20, 20 slots, you know, don't um, just compete and maximize and always look at the uh, always weak point training because it, it, it'll it'll totally change your life. If you, if you look at your, your, your life that way. Now, well, let's look at the case. What's interesting. Does grandpa and grandma? Most likely, yes. But this is a case in hearing loss. So it's probably not. Uh, He's probably not ignoring her. Let's not look at it socially and critically. So let's look at section one, answer questions one through four. Section two, uh, hey, I'm recording here. Hope you didn't hear my son making fun of me. Uh, those of you who have kids, don't you love them? Right? Now all my boys are here. What's, what's the baby doing in here? Okay, so question two, one through four. Okay, and yeah, that's it. Oh, well, it's quick this week. So section one, questions one through four, section two, uh, questions one through four. Okay, and uh, I don't think they're gonna ask too much about this, which is interesting, you know, when you're looking at audiology, but heck, uh, just answer the questions, it should be good. All righty, let me go back. So that's what's due next week. Lesson seven, discussion seven, and your task. All right. And then next week we're meeting at, can you shut that? Thank you. Then next week we're meeting at uh, Health Lab One, 6 p.m. Wednesday. And let's look at, is uh, what what day is that? Uh, November, December. So yeah, it's December 1. So December 1, 6 p.m., Health Lab 1, fourth floor, Alexandria campus. And if you can't make it to the laboratory, please inform me. Because if all of you say I can't make it, why should I go? Right? But I'll probably be there anyway. But I'm sure some of you can make it. Uh, okay. And if it is at this portion of the show, I'll take attendance one more time. There's five of you. I count one, two, three, four. I'll stop recording.